It says, whatsoever does make manifest is light. And we're going to shed light on a lot of very important things, including the issue of abortion and how it impacts the economic condition of the country. So my purpose here is to provide a latest update on the economic context of health care reforms, the background, the economic impact of abortion, current, the current status with respect to COVID-19 and the money we're spending uh, on that, and our future options. And to summarize some key financial features of health care reforms in the current economy. Now, we have to understand the Western world is aging out. We are dying. Our elderly ratios are the highest in the world. Now, that's the ratio of people aged 65 and above to those ages 15 to 64. All right? Our average is nearly 25% elderly. The world average is only about 14%. Uh, the European Union is worse than us. They're at 32%. And Japan is astronomical. They're at 47%. Now, they greatly revere their elders, but they got a lot of elders. And for a long time, they were only having one baby per family. They're now up to about 1.4 on average per family. But they are aging out very badly. Uh, the World War II generation, my parents' generation, are dying at the rate of 1,000 a day. My dad was a World War II veteran. He uh, uh, was interred at Arlington National Cemetery in Washington. And we went there for a, a very fine ceremony. And uh, I asked the chaplain, gee, how often do you do these uh, full military honors ceremonies? He said, oh, 35 a day. I said, what, 35 a day? He said, yeah. They're dying at the rate of 1,000 a day. Now, in contrast, my generation, the baby boom generation, we are turning 65 and going on Medicare and Social Security at the rate of 10,000 a day. So every single day, 1,000 go off the rolls and 10,000 come on the rolls. We are multiplying the drawdown on those programs by a factor of 10 to 1 every single day. By 2030, Medicare will be 90% baby boomers. Now, those of us, that's those of us who were born between 1946 and 1963. And there we are in all of our glory, a bunch of overgrown hippies, right? The quintessential hippie song. You remember this? How many remember this? OK. For a hippy dippy munchy crunchy granola bar, who can name that tune? So happy together. Uh, now, who was the band who played that tune? Can anyone remember who played that tune? Nope. Nope. I'll give you. Who said it? Over there, Ryan. All right, the turtles. OK, the turtles. All right. OK, now here's the timeline of the boomers. We were born 1946 to 63. Look at that cute little guy with the big eyes and that little hippie hat on there. Right there we were born. And then between 64 and 84, we went off to either Vietnam or college or both or neither. All right, watch for the dust off now. There it comes. OK, for a hippy dippy munchy crunchy granola bar, who can name that tune? Oh, come on. How can you miss these? Nobody remembers this? Begins with P. Y U R. Oh, come on. Purple haze. Purple haze. There it is. You're dead. <laughs> Purple haze. OK, now. Jimmy Hendrix. Jim <laughs> uh, you don't get two for getting that. <laughs> All right, Jimmy Hendrix, Purple Haze. OK, then we went off to work, 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 work. Now, the millennials think we're workaholics. We're not workaholics. Our parents were the workaholics. They thought we were lazy. OK, then in 2011, we started turning age 65 and retiring. Now, that process has been going on for 10 years now. 
We have only eight years left, and the last of the boomers will have turned 65 and gone on Medicare and Social Security. Now, a lot of us are delaying retirement, and we're in good health, and so that'll stretch the drawdown for a little bit yet. So, but 2028 is when the last of us turns 65. So go maybe five years beyond that. We're looking at eight, next 13, 14 years is when the tsunami hits, okay? Uh, we are going to then reach 2063. By that time, the last boomer will have reached age 100. And I'm assuming at that point, we will send our Volkswagen Beetles to their final resting place. Okay, who can name that tune? I heard Where Have All the Flowers Gone over here first, and it's not Peter, Paul, and Mary. So who wrote that tune? Who knows who wrote that? I gave it away at the 9 o'clock service. Who wrote that tune? Nobody here from 9 o'clock? Oh, my. Uh, his first name was Pete. Peter Paul. No. Second, last name began with an S. E. Oh. Seeger, Pete Seeger. No granola bar for that. All right, who was the band who played that recording that I just put on? It was a trio. You know what you're all telling me? That you were not hippies. You were not hippies. You were probably. Christian kids who, you know, never even heard this music, right? Kingston Trio. Kingston Trio, there it is, good, Kingston Trio. Okay, well, that's good, there's less repenting need to be. Those who recognize Jimi Hendrix, y'all need to repent. Okay, now, believe it or not, there really was a day when I actually did have hair. Uh, I, was a, I had been saved for about one year at this point, 1975, uh, and uh, believe, I'll tell you a secret, I had been saved a year, and this was after I cut my hair, okay? I used to have hair to the middle of my back. I used to be a lead guitarist in a rock and roll band. You didn't know that, did you? Okay, um, I was a junior accountant in the Waltham Hospital, and I got a white coat and a clipboard. I got to go all over the hospital, uh, checking tag numbers on equipment. I learned all about the hospital equipment. This is what got me into healthcare accounting, which is my field. But 1975, I was a junior accountant. Now I'm just a senior discount. Okay, the silver tsunami, or the silver, we should say the bald tsunami, but the silver-haired tsunami, uh, this is us. Now, you know a tsunami, it just looks like a ripple on the ocean. You don't even notice it until when? Until it reaches the shoreline, then it rears up, right? Well, that's where, when we hit age 65, that's when the tsunami began to peak. And as you can see, uh, where are we? Uh, right about here, 2011, we started turning 65, and that's where the tsunami begins to peak. And it's going to go for, an, it's going to climb for another eight years, okay, as we age out and put extra burden on the system. Now, our economy is based on a pyramid scheme, okay? How many understand what a pyramid scheme is or a Ponzi scheme? If you are doing, uh, Bernie, Bernie uh, Madoff perpetrated one of these, okay, the biggest one in history. Well, the second biggest one in history. Social Security is the biggest one in history, okay? Um, where each new group of investors has to be bigger than the previous one, because they take their money and use it to pay off the first investors. Then the next group comes in and they use their money to pay off the first two groups. Well, that's how Social Security and Medicare work. The new generation has to be bigger than the previous generation because we use their money to pay the previous. So the second generation pays the benefits to the first generation. The third generation pays the benefits to the second and the first. The fourth generation pays the benefits to the third, the second, and the first. So they've got to keep getting bigger and bigger and bigger, which is why a pyramid scheme is illegal because mathematically it must always fail because sooner or later you reach the point where you need more people and more money than exist on the planet. And that's where we are, by the way. But not, not only that, but we've exacerbated the problem. You'll notice this doesn't look like a pyramid. We have here the, um, whoops, we have here the greatest generation born before 1927, pretty small. Then we have the silent generation born between 28 and 45. 
And then we have the boomers, my generation, 46 to 63 or 4. Then we have the Gen Xers. Got any Gen Xers in here, 65 to 80? Yeah, we've got some. And then we have the millennials, 81 to 96. And then we have Gen Zers, 97 to 012. We've got some Gen Zers in here. And then we've got even younger ones. You'll notice there's not a pyramid here. We have curtailed the growth of the population big time. Now, um, this, is, whoa, 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 whoa. this is what the pyramid would have had to have looked like. This is what the population would have had to have looked like in terms of growth to keep the pyramid scheme working. Okay, But we aborted an awful lot of babies. And if you look at what the population would have looked like had it not been for abortion, that's what it would have looked like. It would have filled out the pyramid and the scheme would still be working. But because we aborted them, the pyramid isn't working anymore. And we have a major economic problem. This is a major underlying fundamental problem with the economy. Now, I had the privilege one time <coughs> of uh, meeting and talking with Stephen Gross, who was the chief actuary of the United States. That's the highest ranking mathematician in the world, frankly. He runs the, all the statistics and mathematics for the Social Security and Medicare and those programs. And he was doing a presentation on these very issues, why the Social Security program is going to fail within so many years. And I raised my hand and I asked him, how would these numbers look if since 1973, every family had had just one more baby? He immediately knew exactly what I was getting at. And he said, oh, we've already run those numbers. We would not have this problem today. Quote, that's what he said. All right, so this is not just me. This is the top guy in the world saying this. Okay, uh, in terms of total abortions, this is how they've gone over the years. Um, we've averaged about 1.3 million abortions a year. That's, um, uh, that's 3,500 a day or 221 an hour, assuming a 16 hour a day operation of these mills or four per minute. In the hour and a half that we'll be meeting here today, 332 more babies will be killed. Okay, that's how bad it is. And it's way down from the peak. Now, as a percentage of the US population, we've had 58 million abortions since 1973. However, if half of those babies were male and half of them were female, then that could have made 29 million couples. And since 1973, 18 million of those couples would now be between the ages of 20 and 44, or childbearing, family forming age. If each couple had only one child each, just one baby each, that would have been another 18 million babies would have been born by now to those who were aborted and not allowed to live. If you add that in, then that means that we have lost 76 million people from our population because of abortion. And that's a pretty conservative assumption. Now, out of a 330 million population, that's 23% of the entire United States population. That's more than one out of every five people. Okay, 23%, one out of every five people. So there's a nice looking family bump gone, right? Now, if just the males over age 20 were working, that equates to 18 million workers lost from our economy. 76 million people is almost the entire population of California, Texas, and Virginia combined. Or alternatively, more than the entire population of 30 of our states, including DC, and that's 60% of the states. And here they are listed, either the big ones in blue or the smaller ones in red. And here's a map of how that looks. Those red states represent the total population that have been lost to abortion, or alternatively, California, Texas, and Virginia combined. That's a lot of people. Now, let me ask you this. If terrorists had succeeded in getting into airplanes, loading up with anthrax, and had flown over 30 of our states dropping anthrax, and had succeeded in wiping out the entire population of 30 of our states, 76 million people, would that concern you a little bit? Yeah. Would you be worried about that? 
I think we'd be terrified at that. But yet, that is the equivalent of what we have done. OK, now, I have the utmost respect for our veterans. My dad, that's a picture of my dad there, was a World War II veteran. He was a Marine Corps sergeant. Oh, was he a tough father. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> um, he fought in Iwo Jima, that famous flag-raising statue. He fought there on Saipan, Tinian, Roy and A. Morris, some of the worst battles of the South Pacific during World War II. And you know that generation was always very quiet. They never talked about a lot of things. They were very sensitive to any notion of self-aggrandizement. He always said, we were no heroes. The heroes were the ones who never came home. And if we look at all the war deaths, the revolution, throughout the history of the country, the Revolutionary War, we had 4,000 war deaths. 1812, 2,000. The Indian Wars, 10,000, and so on. The biggest one was the Civil War, a million deaths counting both sides. Now, this is not just deaths on the battlefield. This includes deaths in prison camps, related deaths, associated deaths with the war, OK? Uh, World War II, 400,000. Whoop, 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 whoop. Where are we? World War II, 400,000. Uh, where do we got here? Korea, 54,000. Vietnam, 90,000, including everybody. We come down, we add them all up. The total, 1.7 million war deaths. How many abortion deaths? 58 million. That's 33 times more deaths than all the wars throughout the entire history of the country. It's as if we had fought all the wars through the history of the country 33 times over. That's the equivalent number of deaths. Graphically, I thought this might drive it home if it doesn't already, this is what the graph looks like. Now, the abortion deaths are so enormous, I had a difficult time getting the war deaths to even show up on the graph. You see this little blip right here? That's the one million civil war deaths compared to the abortion deaths. Does that put it in perspective for you? OK, the mother's womb is supposed to be the safest place in the world. It has become the most dangerous place in the world. Now, Proverbs 31.8 says, open your mouth for the dumb. That means those who cannot speak for themselves. Open your mouth for those who cannot speak in the cause of all such as are appointed to destruction. Open your mouth, judge righteously don't be deceived by this nonsense about choice. Every murder is a choice. The issue is not choice. The issue is murder. Okay? Open your mouth. Judge righteously and plead the cause of the poor and needy. That is what God tells us to do. If you forbear to deliver them that are drawn unto death and those that are ready to be slain, if you say, well, behold, we knew it not. We didn't know. Baloney. Does not he that ponders the heart consider it? And he that keeps your soul, does he not know it? And shall he not render to every man according to his works? What are you doing to speak up or do anything at all about this? OK, now back to our elder, elderly ratios. We are the, uh, right here in the United States. Uh, here is Canada, the UK, France, Germany, all worse than us, Japan up here, uh, China's down here. Here's the world average. We are, the Western world is way above average in terms of the elderly ratios. In contrast, the growing, developing world has the lowest ratios in the world. Turkey, 13%, South Africa, 8 Iran, 9 Iraq, 6 Nigeria, 5 Saudi Arabia, 5 the UAE, United Arab Emirates, 1.4% elderly. Either their old people die really young or they got a lot of babies, I don't know. But uh, you'll notice that it's, uh, as we view this, it's mostly the Middle Eastern, the African, and the Latin American countries that are growing by leaps and bounds. They have an average of four to six babies per family depending on the country. And here's their ratios relative to the World average, they're all way down on the low side. They are very, very young with booming populations. Now, this is creating an international crisis, the same, which is the same, really, regardless of country or social system. We have unlimited, increasing demand for health care and social services. 
compounded by COVID-19 now in the face of limited resources, and every country has to allocate those resources somehow. Every country tries it differently, and every country has their problems. That's why we call economics the dismal science, because the optimal solution is where everyone is equally unhappy, right? Because nobody can have everything they want, right? Now, in the pre early previous century, there were three economists, Moses and Jerome Horvitz and Louis Feinberg, who really understood this. And they opened a little shop called the Fix-It Shop. And their motto was, we're not happy till you're not happy. Okay? They got it. They understood it. Now, that's not just in there to be silly. We're actually going to come back to that later. So remember this. We're not happy till you're not happy, because that's what's going to make everybody happy. Okay? Okay. Now, if you look at the ratio of workers to Social Security beneficiaries, back uh, in 1945, we had 42 workers per retiree quickly dropped to 16, down to eight. The time we started Medicare, we had five workers per retiree. We are now down to 2.7. We will be dropping to just a little over two workers per retiree. So I tell my students, every two of you will be supporting every one of me in, my nur in our nursing home, okay? That's a pretty heavy burden. This picture really tells the story. We have these grandparents, uh, being supported by this poor middle-aged couple being crushing this little baby who's expected to support all of this. We've turned the pyramid, the pyramid upside down is what we've done. Now, we have to define some terms. In order to understand the economics of this, we need to understand debt and deficit and on budget and off budget. What does all this mean? Well, hopefully we can decrypt some of this for you. The, when you hear about the federal deficit, that's the, the country's net loss for one year. You know, you have a business. You have sales, profit, right? And you have expenses, and you have a profit, right? Well, the federal government takes a loss every year, or just about every year. They have tax revenues that come in. They have expenses that go out. And they have a loss for the year. That's the deficit. But Congress has an option. They can take things off budget. Now, let me give you an example. If you wanted to go to a bank to borrow some money, but you had a ton of credit card debt that you really would rather not uh, um, show the bank, you can just sort of take that off budget and not show them, right? Say, well, that's special. We don't, you don't need to see that, right? Would a bank let you do that? No, that would be fraud, right? But Congress can do that. Congress can decide that anything is a special case and take it off budget, so it's not part of the budget deficit. Now, currently, Social Security and the Post Office are the only two items off budget. That's because they're such big losers. Um, but they can change this at will. Everything else is on budget. Now, what is debt? Debt is the money the federal government borrows, loans they take out. Now, we use these loans to pay the government's bills, i.e., cover the deficit. Or we also use them to expand the money supply, which we will see later. Now, what are the sources of our debt financing? We have two sources. One is called public debt. This is what you always hear about in the news, the public debt. This is all they ever tell you about, but there is a lot more to the story. Okay, Public debt is loans that the federal government takes out from the general public, foreign governments, private investors, pension funds, individuals. Um, in terms of foreign governments, China and Japan are our biggest lenders. They're each into us for over a trillion dollars, okay? Uh, and this is usually all that ever gets reported in the media, although they don't talk about China and Japan. Now, if you look at all the foreign holders of our public debt, we have uh, China at a trillion dollars, Japan at a trillion dollars, then we have Ireland lends us money, Brazil lends us money, the United Kingdom lends us money, Switzerland lends us money, Luxembourg lends us money, the Cayman Islands lends us money. Well, you know, the drug dealers got to put their money somewhere, you know, okay. Uh, Hong Kong, Belgium, and a whole bunch of other folks lend us money, okay. So all of the foreign holders of our debt, 35% is China and Japan. Now, Let's talk about more. It's not just the public debt. We also have what's called government debt. Well, wait a minute, I thought it's all government debt. What do you mean government debt? 
government debt is money that the federal government borrows from other federal agencies, notably the Medicare and Social Security trust funds. Now, the way this works is we pay in our Medicare and Social Security taxes, and they're supposed to go into a trust fund where the money is saved and invested for our future benefits. Isn't that what a trust fund is supposed to do? Yep. Yeah. Well, unfortunately, that's not how it works. They're not allowed to invest it in the stock market or anywhere else. They're only allowed to lend it out to other federal government agencies at interest. Okay? So we pay in our taxes. It goes into the fund. The fund lends it out to other agencies who spend it. The money is spent. It's not there. Okay? Now, I have a contact at the General Accounting Office uh, in the federal government and the GAO, and I've asked him, how often have we loaned that money out and gotten it paid back and then loaned it out again and gotten it paid back? He said, oh, never. We've never been paid back. Not one dime, not ever. In, 19, in, 20, 19, that's me. in 2015, we did pay some interest back, but that was because the funds would have gone insolvent if we hadn't. Okay? So bottom line is the money is not there. It's spent. Now, how are they ever going to pay it back? There's only two ways. One, raise our income taxes to bring in money for Congress to do appropriations to give money to those agencies so they can pay their loans back through Medicare and Social Security. That means we will have paid our taxes twice. Alternatively, they go out and issue more public debt to raise money to replace the, uh, the, the, the government debt. So either, no matter how you slice it, it's a burden on the taxpayer. Now, these things are evidenced by what's called certificates of indebtedness. These are non-marketable congressional IOUs. In other words, they lend the money out and Congress writes an IOU and sticks it in the trust fund. Okay? These are backed by nothing but the full faith and credit of the U.S. Congress. Doesn't that warm your heart, right? If you buy that, I've got a bridge to sell you, okay? You all know what that means, right? You know, you're old enough to understand that one. Okay, all right. Now, uh, we've borrowed about $3.2 trillion from the Medicare trust funds and the Social Security trust funds. And, okay, this I talked about already. All right, now... What about where we're spending the money? These are our federal social service expenditures. Now, all of my numbers throughout this presentation are all knocked down for inflation. They're all adjusted, adjusted for inflation. So there's no funny money in here. This is real amounts, okay? Now, back here at the time of World War II, we had very little in terms of social service expenditures. And then we get up to the mid-60s, the Kennedy-Johnson era, the great society philosophy of government, the Vietnam War, and two very critical Supreme Court decisions. 1963, Murray v. Curlett. Who knows what that was? Madeline Murray O'Hare sued the Maryland School District uh, to have them stop forcing her son to read the Bible or have Bible lessons in, in school. Her son, by the way, later repudiated all of that and became a Christian. She was also, by the way, murdered by her own financial officer. But in any event, Madeline Murray O'Hare succeeded in getting the Bible thrown out of schools. We threw God out of our schools in 1963. Just 10 years later, what did we do? Roe v. Wade. Now, you all know that one, right? We legalized the shedding of innocent blood. Okay, it just took 10 years of no Bible in the schools before we went that far off the cliff. Okay, now, the bottom row here is the money we spend on educating people at the federal level. Now, at the state level, we spend a lot of money educating people, but at the federal level, we don't spend very much educating our population. The next row up is what we spend on veterans' benefits. We don't spend a whole lot of money taking care of our veterans. We really don't. And then the next one is uh, unemployment. We spend a bunch of money paying for folks when they're out of work. And then uh, Medicaid, that's health care for the low-income individuals, the poor. And then Medicare, health care for the elderly, those who are retired. And then Social Security uh, for those who are retired. And then this giant leap here is the COVID spending. We've spent, in just this year, we've spent $3 trillion on COVID benefits. Now, just for fun, what, oh, 
just for fun, at the top of the stack, I put interest on the federal debt in each year, so you can see that it is more than what we spend on education and VA benefits in every year, interest, and that's going to continue to grow. Now you can say, well, I mean, how are we paying for all this? People ask me that. How are we going to pay for all this COVID stuff? Never mind the COVID stuff. How are we going to pay for any of this? The answer is we are not paying for it. We are borrowing money and printing money, borrowing money and printing money, borrowing money and printing money. Okay, this is the national debt. Okay, uh, as you can see, it began climbing, 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 climbing. It's now over, on an inflation adjusted basis, it's over $30 trillion. That's trillion with a T. If you don't inflation adjust it, it's $32.5 trillion. Okay, that includes $4 trillion of COVID debt, money we borrowed to pay COVID benefits, $4 trillion with a T. Okay, but that's just the tip of the iceberg. As I mentioned this morning, how much of the iceberg, for a granola bar here, how much of the iceberg shows above the surface of the water? 10%. 10%. I can reach you, Jimmy. There we go. Whoa, sorry. 90% of the iceberg is hidden below the surface of the water, and you never see it until you shipwreck your boat. Okay? We're going to shed light on that other 90% tonight. You're going to see for yourself what's the rest of the iceberg that's out there that is going to shipwreck this boat. Okay? Now you can say, well, you know, gee, I mean, who was minding the store? I mean, someone's in control of this. Well, all right, before we get there, think of the biblical context here. For the Deuteronomy 15, 6, For the Lord thy God blesses thee, speaking to Israel, as he promised thee, and thou shalt lend unto many nations, but thou shalt not borrow. And thou shalt reign over many nations, but they shall not reign over thee. So a sign of God's blessings was that you would lend and not borrow. We're clearly on the other side of that equation. Isaiah 3.12, as for my people, children are their oppressors. Women rule over them. Think of Nancy Pelosi types, right? Uh, oh, my people, they which lead thee cause thee to err and destroy the way of thy paths. I won't say it. Okay, so here is the federal budget. The, the bars are the federal budget. The dots are the revenues. The bars are the expenditures. The blue regions are where the Democrats had control of both houses of Congress. The red areas are where the Republicans had control of both houses of Congress. The green areas are where one house was Democrat and the other house was Republican. Okay, and it is Congress that holds the purse strings. Congress controls the budget, okay? I have also the presidents with their party affiliations on here. And you can see that the revenues pretty well track the expenditures until we get to Reagan. Reagan was successful in cutting taxes. He was not successful in cutting the budget. So we started having deficits here where the revenues were less than the expenses. And that continued onward. And then we get to George W. Bush. We actually had a surplus where revenues were more than expenses. How many remember getting your surplus check? $650 check in the mail. Well, you know what? As much as that was nice, uh, I, I wasn't in agreement with what, what they did with the money. Because none of that was on budget surplus. All of that was off budget surplus. In other words, what it was was an unexpectedly high collection of Social Security taxes. It should have been put into the Social Security Trust Fund where it's so desperately needed, but instead, I guess, you know, for whatever reason, they decided to just mail it all back to us. And they did. Well, it wasn't long thereafter we plunged back into deficit. And then we reach here. This is 2008, the market crash. You can see where the revenues dropped way down and expenses went way up and we had a humongous deficit. And then it began coming back and then down a little bit and then we have a big deficit going forward. And then look at this giant spike here. This giant spike right here. You know what that is? That's the COVID spending, okay? That's the COVID spending. Look at the size of the deficit we have from this point up here down to the revenues down here. We have a massive deficit at this point. Now, a couple of things to notice. One, do you see any places on here where there's an absolute reduction in federal spending? Well, a couple. 
Uh, under Truman, after World War II, we had a scale down of federal spending. And the time of the market crash, we had a scale down of spending because we had no option, right? But other than that, it almost doesn't matter which party is in control. The spending just keeps going up and up and up and up and up. And you want to know why? Because we're now at the point where over 55% of the federal budget is entitlement programs that are locked into law and escalate every year. They're on autopilot, and the only way to stop it is to legislate reduction in benefits, and that's never going to happen, okay? Because no congressman ever got elected by campaigning on cutting benefits and raising taxes, right? We'll never vote them in as voters. Okay, so here's the debt graph again, only this time with all the presidents on there. And you'll notice people used to complain that George W. Bush had increased the debt. Well, he did at a lower pace his first term and back to the same old pace the second term. But then, um, since 2008, through Obama, Trump, and now Biden, the federal debt has gone up by way, way more than the entire previous history of the country combined from George Washington to George W. Bush. Okay? Think about that. Okay? And that since 2008, our debt has gone up by more, way more, than the entire previous history of the country combined. Okay? Over $30 trillion. Now, people say, well, you've got to understand the debt in respect to the size of the economy. The economy is bigger today. We can, we can withstand more debt. Well, okay, let's look at the ratio of federal debt to gross domestic product. That's an index of the size of the economy. The last time it was more than 100% of the economy was back at World War II. For three years, we had more debt than the whole size of the entire United States economy. We have now had debt over 100% of GDP for 13 years. And look at this spike. This is the new COVID debt spiked on top here, okay, at 114% of GDP. Essentially, we have hawked the entire U.S. economy, okay? We have pawned the entire U.S. economy to our creditors, okay? Now, gross domestic product is just an index of the size of the economy. It doesn't pay the bills. Who pays the bills? Taxpayers pay the bills. We write the checks that pay the bills. So let's drill down a little bit. Okay, a growing economy should mean we have more households earning more income, paying more taxes. Well, indeed, we have had more households growing steadily. That's nice. However, if you look at the debt per household, the debt per household has climbed to much higher than it ever was before, $221,000 per household on an inflation-adjusted basis at a time when the median household income has stayed pretty level. It's about $68,000 today, median income, but the debt has gone way, way up per household. Now, tax returns filed are in up, indeed, that's true, but we've got a problem. Today, only about 57% of the filers actually pay taxes. Now, you may remember when I think it was Mitt Romney or someone said this in Florida and the news reporters just ate him alive. He was speaking the truth, he was right, okay, 43% of the people who file tax returns pay no taxes. They're either getting 100% refund or they didn't owe any taxes at all to begin with, okay? They made a paid in taxes on their payroll and got it all back. Only 57% of the tax filers actually pay taxes. So we've got the problem now where half the country is supporting the other half of the country, okay? You've probably heard the expression the number of people who vote for a living now exceed the number of people who work for a living. Now, that's, don't get me into trouble saying a statement like that, but okay, let's drill down a little bit. What about those people who don't pay taxes? Well, we have folks who had either zero net income and payroll taxes. They paid in, they got it back, they had net, no obligation, that's 24%. 
or those who had no taxes at all. Now that's the group I want to get into. You know, I've got a friend who's a tax partner in a big CPA firm, and I said, what can I do to minimize my taxes? He says, there's nothing left. He said, the only thing is be a farmer. Farmers can have all the losses they want. He said, yeah, but I got a full-time job. I don't know anything about farming. Okay, that's 15%. Now that could be retired people, by the way. A lot of people uh, are retired and don't owe any taxes, right? A lot of folks are getting earned income credit or other things, low-income individuals, okay? But bottom line, 56% are paying in taxes, 43% are not paying taxes. Okay, now if we look at the debt per taxpayer, it's now more than four times higher than at the time of World War II. That's over $300,000 per taxpayer. So the burden today is much, much higher than it was at the time of World War II. Okay, let's look at the states for a minute. The states have problems just like the federal government does. If we look at the state debt and unfunded liabilities, such as state pension funds for their employees, uh, post-retirement health benefits and other obligations, if we look at those as a percentage of state GDP or the size of the state economies, uh, we can see where we stand here. Now, the best states here are Nebraska and Tennessee, South Dakota, Iowa. Texas is right here in the middle. The worst ones are New Jersey, Connecticut, Hawaii. They have upwards of 35% of their economy they owe in debt. If we look at the state revenue shortfalls from COVID, well, Pennsylvania, Maryland, Massachusetts didn't do too badly, but look at Arkansas, Louisiana, look at Arkansas. Arkansas is losing 65% of their state revenues, undoubtedly because of oil, oil money, uh, due to COVID. They lost a massive amount of their state revenues. The state unemployment or jobless rate, Massachusetts, 17.5% unemployment. Texas is about the middle. What's that? Kentucky, Utah, they're not too bad. 4%, 5% unemployment. States who have rainy day funds. You all know Texas has a rainy day fund. We're one of the few. Uh, Texas is up here. We've got a pretty decent rainy day fund, about 20% of a year's revenues stashed away in the bank. Uh, Wyoming, oh my goodness, they have 95% of a year's revenue stashed away in a bank. They're in great shape. <laughs> And then you look down here at the states that have no rainy day fund, like Kansas and Illinois, Pennsylvania, New Jersey. They, these, this group always shows up at the bottom of the pile. Don't ever move to those states. They're in terrible shape. Okay, so let's combine this all into a single composite index, right? What state is in the best shape? Wyoming, right, because they have that giant rainy day fund. What state is in the worst shape? Illinois and New Jersey, right? Don't go to those states. Where's Texas? Texas is up here. We're not too bad. We're, we're about here. Okay. Now, the bailouts. People ask me, well, what, about, what happened with the bailouts? Believe it or not, we have made a profit on the bailouts. We, we gave out $634 billion bailing out companies during the economic crisis. Most of it went to banks and financial institutions and Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, which are these quasi-federal entities that buy mortgages from banks, okay? Uh, that was 400, over $436 billion went to them. Then we gave money to the car companies, and then we gave money to AIG Insurance Company, and then we gave money to what the, the news media always calls the toxic asset buyback program. Well, that's a ridiculous nonsense. News reporters drive me nuts. What this was is people had accounts receivable from their customers. Their customers were not paying on those accounts and they had uncollectible accounts. So the federal government came in and said, okay, we will buy those bad accounts from you. So we make them whole, and then we as the taxpayers absorb the losses from the uncollectible accounts receivable. Now, nobody ever asked me if I wanted to do that, okay, but I guess it was good for the country. That's what we did. All right, so that's how much we spent, what, about $18 billion buying back people's bad accounts receivable. And uh, so we shelled out $634 billion. However, we've gotten back 
$743 billion. First of all, many bailed out companies gave their money back at the first opportunity. There were just too many federal strings attached and they didn't want it. So $390 billion came back. Plus, we've got all this money down here called dividends, interest, and other fees earned. While we had invested in General Motors stock and other company stock, we just kind of said, you need to pay us a dividend. And they shelled out money, and we collected a dividend. We extracted $353 billion from the private sector in that process. But bottom line, we shelled out $634 billion. We got back $743 billion. We made $100 billion on the bailouts. What a great deal. We should have more bailouts. Bail me out. This would be great, right? We make money on bailouts. I don't know. Something bothers me about that. Okay. Now, let's look at the rest of the iceberg, okay? If we look at our national debt in nominal dollars, it's $32.5 trillion, but that's just the tip of the iceberg. If you look at the Medicare obligations at present value, that means the value today of our future Medicare obligations minus the premiums we would collect on those you know, that insurance, okay, and bring it back to today, that is almost $73 trillion. That's twice the national debt, okay? Then we have the Medicaid program for the poor, CHIP for children, and other health programs. If we look at the value today of those future obligations, and these are entitlements cast in law, okay? That's another $52 trillion, one and a half times the federal debt. Now the kicker, Social Security. If we look at the present value or the value today of our Social Security benefits, it's $93.5 trillion, three times the federal debt. Medicare and Social Security are five times the federal debt. Then we have the federal employee, veterans, retirement, and other health benefits. That's another $8.5 trillion. Then we've got the 50 states with Medicaid, unfunded pension and other post-employment benefits, that's another 26 trillion. Then we have the cost of renovating all of our infrastructure. You all remember the levees that collapsed in New Orleans, the bridge that collapsed in Minnesota. If you've ever driven on the Bronx Queens Expressway in New York, it is scary. I mean, it's traffic 24-7, 365, and it goes like this while you're driving on it. I mean, someday it's gonna hit that resonant frequency and it's gonna come down, and I don't wanna be on it when it does. I haven't been up there in ages, but I wouldn't wanna be. We've got roads, bridges, levees, dams, water and sewer systems, rail systems, schools, aviation and transit systems that all are in desperate need of renovation and repair. The American Society of Civil Engineers every year goes out and surveys our bridges. Do you know the typical bridge in America is rated as unsafe? That's true. The typical bridge in America is rated as unsafe, and they estimate it's gonna cost nearly $6 trillion to fix all of our crumbling infrastructure. So if you add all this up, it adds up to $291 trillion in obligations. Now, that's nearly a third of a quadrillion dollars, okay? You know, you got, what are they, gigabytes, terabytes, picobytes, right? We got millions, billions, trillions, quadrillions. This is nearly a third of a quadrillion dollars, okay? Now, we're leaving those obligations to the next generation when they will have half the relative collective earning power that we have to pay these bills when we can't pay them. Because remember, we started this when we had five workers per retiree and we're dropping to 2.3. That's less than half the collective earning power to pay these bills. How are we gonna expect our kids and their kids to pay these bills when we can't pay them, okay? Now, if you went to a bank and said, uh, gee, I'd like to buy 200, borrow $290 trillion, you gonna give me a loan? Well, if you go and you ask for a mortgage in sensible times, they would ask for two pieces of information. Number one, how much do you make? And number two, what's your net worth? What's your equity, right? What are you worth? Well, what are we worth in America? If you look at the total household 
and nonprofit organization net worth. Now, that household includes all the for profit corporate stock holdings, like Bill Gates and other people who own lots of stock, right? That's all counted. The nonprofits, that includes the Rockefeller Foundation, you know, the Gates, Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, Warren Buffett's Foundation, George Soros's foundations, all, the Harvard Endowment, all the big private nonprofits, right? If you add it all up, the total net worth of America is $130 trillion. Now, I had a colleague in Australia, and uh, when he saw this presentation, I've done this in Australia and in New Zealand, by the way, a wonderful privilege and opportunity to do that. Uh, he said, now I can answer my daughter. I said, what? He said, she was asking me, Daddy, how much would it cost to buy America? And he says, now I can tell her, $130 trillion. I said, uh-uh, we're upside down. We couldn't give away America. Okay, now, $130 trillion of equity. How much are our obligations? 290. We owe two and a quarter times more than we're worth. We're upside down, folks. We're underwater, seriously underwater, okay? We owe more than twice our total net worth, including Bill Gates's, Warren Buffett's, George Soros's, and all the nonprofit foundation's net worth. If we were to confiscate all the wealth in the country. I had an opportunity one time to meet, um, uh, um, oh my goodness, uh, Tom and Pat Frost. You know Frost Bank? I was at a, a university fundraiser event and they were there and I got to talk with Pat Frost. And I was talking about some of these issues with her. And she, you know, they're billionaires. And she said to me, what can people in our wealth class do to help? I thought that was very nice of her. And I said, Pat, if we confiscated all the money in the country, it wouldn't even cover half these obligations, okay? We could only cover actually 45% of these obligations. Well, how much wealth is there on the whole planet? On the whole, on the whole planet Earth, there is just slightly under $400 trillion of wealth. Our share of that, 130 out of 400, is about one third, about 33%. We would have to consume 73%, twice our share, of the entire world's wealth to meet these obligations, okay? We would have to go to the rest of the world and say, give us all your wealth so you can support us in our nursing homes. I don't think so. All right, that's on our wealth. What about how much we make? How much do you make? Okay. Well, if you take the $291 trillion of obligations and divide it over 128 million households, that's two and a quarter million dollars per household. You have a two and a quarter million dollar mortgage you didn't know about left to you by the last 40 years of your political leaders, okay? You ever seen that commercial on TV a few years ago? They had the, guy coming on saying, you know, my little daughter was just born and she already owes $30,000. No, she doesn't. She owes two and a quarter million dollars. Okay. Now, what's our income? The median household income is $68,000. Two and a quarter million over 68 is 33 years of income. Now, if you went to a bank and you wanted to take out a mortgage for a house, they might lend you two, two and a half times your income if you're getting a good interest rate. This is 33 years of income. Now that would mean that we would have to have combined federal and state income taxes. Uh, they'd have to tax away 100% of our median income for the next 33 years in order to pay these obligations. Minor problem. If you tax away 100% of my income, I starve to death within two weeks, right? So that doesn't work. So how about if we amortize this over 75 years, that could get the tax rate down to 44% uh, of our income for the next 75 years. Now, oh, I forgot to ask you, for a granola bar, remember we said the boomers would be in the system for 53 years, from the time they started retiring to the time they reached age 100. 53 years, and I had a little Volkswagen Beetle there. How many remember the relationship of the number 53 to the Volkswagen Beetles? Now, some of you young parents should know this. Herbie, Herbie the love bug. Can you get it? 
All right, good. Herbie the love bug. Remember in Herbie Goes Bananas, the little Mexican boy call, kept calling him Ocho. And they're saying, why are you calling him Ocho? He says, because. Cinco y tres es Ocho, right? OK. 53 years of boomers in the system. This is 75 years. That means our kids and their kids will be con devoting their entire working lifetimes to paying off our bills, and we'll still be paying our bills 22 years after the last boomer is dead and gone. That's something to look forward to, isn't it? OK. You know, I tell my students, you know what? I'm going to be one of the very few people lying in my nursing home bed. When you come sneaking through the door and around the corner reaching for my plug, I'm going to lean over and say, it's OK. I understand. You don't have the money. OK, now, so let's go to the rest of the world. We say, hey, you know, guys, we bailed you out after World War II. We rebuilt Europe. You know, we've done an awful lot. We've loaned you money, and you defaulted, never paid us back. Come on, it's the time you pitch in and help us now, right? So let's go to the rest of the world. Let's see. We've got $291 in trillion in obligations, $130 in equity. So we confiscate everybody's wealth. We're still short by $160 trillion. So we go to our neighbors and we say, listen, guys, can you lend us some money? We need some help. It's about time you turn about fair play here. And they say, well, OK, uh, how much are you talking about? They say, $160 trillion. $160 trillion? You've got to be kidding me, right? Uh, yeah, can you help us out? Uh, you realize, of course, that that would consume all of the wealth of China, the entire Asia-Pacific region, including Southeast Asia, Australia, New Zealand, all of the wealth of India, that's 163 trillion, pretty close. And that represents four and a half billion people. So you want us to give you, uh, you all of our wealth while our four and a half billion people starve to death? I don't, just, just to support you in your nursing homes? I don't think so. As a matter of fact, you know what I think they're going to say to us? They're going to say to us, hey, wait a minute. Our people don't have benefits like that. Why should your people have benefits like that? You know what? You need to cut your benefits. That way, your people will be a little unhappy, just like our people are unhappy. And that'll bring us closer to the optimal economic solution where everybody is unhappy, and that will make us happy. Right? You remember the Three Stooges? Right? I told you that. They had it down. They understood this. OK. Now, understand the context. That 44% tax rate for 75 years assumes that all of that money goes to nothing else but this short list of obligations. This is not the whole federal budget, folks. This is just the biggies. There's a whole lot more to the federal budget. And by 2030, these items are going to consume 80% of the federal budget, crowding out every other federal service. Do you want things like defense, schools, fire department, police, transportation, water? Sanitation, a criminal justice system, the multitude of entitlements, grants, subsidies, and other federal budget items. Oh, you want all that too? Well, some economists have estimated it would take tax rates of 83 to 86% combined federal and state to meet these obligations and enjoy the level of federal services that we so wonderfully enjoy today. Observation. We have become the greatest debtor nation in the entire history of the world. No country in the history of the world has ever been anywhere near as indebted as we are right now today. Thomas Jefferson talked about this in 1816. And this is not a spurious internet quote. This is a real quote from a real letter from the National Archives. Okay, The principle of spending money today to be paid by posterity, our kids, under the name of funding current obligations, is but swindling fu the future on a large scale. This is a swindle. Pyramid schemes are illegal for a reason. They are a swindle. And we are in the failure of the pyramid right now. OK, you don't believe me? These are my sources. Everything comes from authoritative public sources. I tell people in my audiences, if uh, if you don't like what I say, don't get mad. Get data, right? I'm not giving you much in the way of opinion here. This is hard data. And I do this presentation all over the place. I've done, I, as a matter of fact, just last weekend, I was up in Austin doing it to a group 
of uh, 280 of the top fin healthcare financial officers in the, throughout the state of Texas and outside of Texas. Um, in October, I'll be doing it again for the same group in New Orleans for a five-state region. I've had corporations fly me in and pay me to do this presentation while they broadcast it to three different states of their offices. Okay, This is for real. And, I, and I've related to some of the top people in the country who know this better than anyone. David Walker, I don't want to sound like a name dropper, but I want you to understand the credibility of this information. David Walker, the former Comptroller General of the United States. I've met him twice, talked with him. He talks about these same issues. I got some of my ideas from him. Okay, uh, Gene Dodaro, the current Comptroller General of the United States. I've not only talked to him, um, here's his business card. You know what's written on it? Send PowerPoint. I have sent him my PowerPoint, top ranking financial guy in the country. Okay, Stephen Gross, the chief actuary of the United States, and others. Uh, oh, Roman Van Daniker, the head of the Government Finance Officers Association. Quote, he's a colleague, I know Roman. He said, I sure hope we accountants are wrong because if we're right, we're in a heap of trouble. Okay, that's the top guy of the Government Financial Officers Association. Okay, this is not just little old me, senior discount. The top people in the country know this. Okay, what are the options? Raise taxes, cut benefits, grow the economy, right? Those are the standard options. Raise taxes. Well, the last tax bill cut taxes. The current bill that's in play in Congress would raise three trillion of taxes over 10 years. Well, it's a drop in the bucket, frankly. It's 1% of what we need. Cut benefits. Huh, we're not doing that. We just added $3 trillion in COVID benefits. We just recently added the $1.2 trillion Affordable Care Act entitlement program on top of all the others. Congress tried to cancel it and was not successful multiple times. You know, the problem is, folks, once you get the toothpaste out of the tube, it is awfully hard to put it back in, right? Once you have granted an entitlement program, you can never take it back. The people just will not let you. Why? Think of seniors on Social Security. Don't you dare cut my Medicare. Don't you dare cut my Social Security. Don't you dare raise my taxes. I'll vote you right out of office. Don't you cut all the fraud, waste, and inefficiency out of government before you talk to me about taking any more of my hard-earned money. Right? We'll vote them out of office, won't we? We as voters bear the responsibility because even if they wanted to, which they don't, we would not let them raise taxes or cut benefits. Grow the economy. Well, frankly, oh, by the way, no one ever won an election by promising to raise taxes and cut benefits. Okay, grow the economy. The economy was growing quite nicely in the previous administration until we hit the lockdowns, the COVID lockdowns. The COVID lockdowns just trashed the world economy, okay? Now, w growing the economy was nice, but frankly, it would take decades of double-digit growth to grow our way out of this. We've never had double-digit growth in the entire history of the country. How are we going to attain double-digit growth when we're still trying to recover from the worst recessions since the Great Depression and 30% of our population is retiring out of the workforce? How are we going to attain double-digit growth? We're not. It isn't going to happen. So what other options do we have? Default. Believe it or not, in that group last weekend of, of high-level Healthcare financial executives, somebody raised their hand and said, well, what if we just don't pay? I was flabbergasted. I said, well, if we don't pay China back, there's a trillion, you know, I wouldn't be too upset about that. They're just printing up the money anyway. Uh, but, you know, I didn't think that, I'm not that quick on my feet. What I should have said, oh, Medicare and Social Security don't pay. That means we're going to have dead seniors all over the streets because they don't have the Social Security money to go to the grocery store? Come on, that's not realistic. You can't do that, right? Well, we are under what's called a sequestration, a 2% sequestration. Now, talking to a group like that, uh, they understand this because every bill they submit to Medicare, Medicare says, yep, legitimate bill, knock off 2%, here's 98%. That's how they do it. 2% sequestration. Why? We don't have the money, okay? The trustees of the Medicare and Social Security trust funds for years in their reports have put we need a 25% cut in benefits. We're going to go broke. They've been saying that for years, but it falls on deaf ears because no, no member of Congress would ever get away with cutting program benefits by 25%. A 25% sequestration, 
every health care provider in the country would go bankrupt. Okay? To cut Medicare payments by 25%, every, every small physician's practice, every clinic, most of your hospitals would all go broke. They'd go bankrupt. So there's been no takers. So the politicians say, well, I believe in pay as you go. Oh, you know what that means, don't you? If there's no money, you don't go, right? So that's no answer. It sounds nice in a soundbite on the media, but it's, it's a meaningless answer. Okay, inflate the currency. Aha, this is what we've been doing, all right? The Federal Reserve has inflated our money supply by $4.6 trillion, rising the debt. <laughs> stimulus, that one kills me. We need more stimulus. These are phony terms. What they're talking about is inflating the money supply and debasing the value of the dollar bill, okay? Now, it did help us dodge an economic depression. We were actually reeling some of that excess money back in for a while. We basically replaced the money that was lost in the market. We nationalized private sector losses. We gave the federal government dollars it needs to pay its bills. And we earn interest, uh, the, the banks earn interest on that money. Now, let, let me ask you this. When you need money for your household or your small business, you need money, and you don't have enough money, what can you do? Well, you just go down to the seedier part of town and meet up with your local counterfeiter and ask him to gin up the presses and start printing you some money, right? And you take that money to pay your bills. Wonderful, right? That's how it works, isn't it? No, that's called a crime, and you go to jail for that, right? Ah, but that's the role that the Federal Reserve plays for the federal government. When Congress needs money, they issue bonds to the Federal Reserve, who creates money out of thin air and lends it to the federal government, and they spend it on their programs. That's expanding the money supply, inflating the currency with money created out of thin air. What a deal. And they get to get that back with interest. Wouldn't you love to own a Federal Reserve Bank? What a deal that is. Okay, this is Federal Reserve Day. Now back here, up until 1973, our money supply was pretty small and stable. This is where we deregulated the price of gold. We went off the last vestiges of a hard currency standard where the dollar bill was pegged to uh, a precious metal. And then we began slowly inflating the currency on a nice gentle upward slope, creating the illusion of growth in the economy, okay? Then 2008 happened. Boom, the world changed. We went on quantitative easing one. That was inflating the money supply. You can see it in the graph. Quantitative easing two. There you can see it in the graph. Quantitative easing three. We did more inflation there. And then we went on an unofficial quantitative easing four up to here expanding the money supply. Then, during the previous administration, the economy was starting to grow again, and we began reeling the money back in. This was great. This was exactly what they were supposed to do. As the economy recovers, pull that money back in, and everything will go back to normal. Then, the lockdowns. Wham! We added all this more money to the money supply. About $4 trillion uh, added since 4.6 trillion added since 2008. We've inflated the money supply 643%. You don't see it, but the truth of the matter is we are living under a regime of 640% inflation right now. That graph, when I first started building this graph, I said, you know, um, I remember the hyperinflation, not personally, but I remember <laughs> learning about the hyperinflation in post-World War I Germany, the Weimar Republic. And I was curious, and I said, you know, I wonder what that looked like. So I got the data. That little red line there, that's the inflation trajectory from the hyperinflation in post-World War I Germany. Weimar Republic, the German mark price of one ounce of gold from the five-year period 1919 to 1923. Look at that trajectory. It's almost identical. Now, I tell my audiences, of all the graphs in this presentation, this one scares me, okay? And as a matter of fact, this graph tells the whole story, if you understand this graph. Why does this scare me? Because we all know what happened in post-World War I Germany. The hyperinflation 
led to extreme political polarization. Are we seeing extreme political polarization? An extremist party got into power. What was the name of that party? The National... What does it stand for? What does NAZI stand for? What, is it, what does that stand for? The National Socialist Party in German. I don't know who speaks German in here. Anybody? Oh, this is New Braunfels. Somebody must speak German in here, right? Well, in German, it shortens to Nazi. It's National Social Elites and blah, 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 whatever it is, okay? They got into, par they got into power. They began imposing you know, totalitarian policies, and the rest is history. Do we see that political potential in this country today? Absolutely, I think we do anyway. That's why this graph scares me. So why are we not seeing hyperinflation? Well, let's look at an example. I had a student from Zimbabwe. In 2008, Zimbabwe had hyperinflation. She gave me these. This is a $25 million bill. This is a $50 million bill. These are dated 2008. This is a $50 billion bill. Okay? Uh, there's a picture on the internet of a homeless person with a cardboard sign with these things stuck on it. It says, homeless billionaire. Okay? <laughs> the largest denomination bill ever printed in the history of the world, a $100 trillion bill. They've got one of these on display in the Reserve Bank Museum in, in Wellington, New Zealand. Uh, and you can buy these off the internet for 40 bucks as souvenirs. Okay? Uh, they are literally not worth the, the paper they're printed on. Why? The entire economy of Zimbabwe wasn't worth $100 trillion. These things are worthless. And, you know, inflation is not magic. It does not happen because of some invisible market forces. Inflation is a product of conscious government policy to expand or contract the money supply. That's what makes it happen, okay? Do you know what stopped the hyperinflation in Zimbabwe? The company in Europe that produces the paper that this money was printed on finally got to the point where they said, you know, we can no longer in good conscience keep selling these people this paper to keep printing this worthless currency, and they stopped selling them the paper. That's what stopped the hyperinflation. So they went off the Zimbabwean dollar. They now peg their currency to the US dollar. Oh, dear. Out of the frying pan into the fire, I think. OK? That's what hyperinflation looks like. Now, why aren't we seeing it? Two reasons. Pizzanomics, number one. Pizzanomics. We had some college students who went into a pizza parlor. And they ordered a pepperoni pizza. And the guy asked them, do you want your pizza cut into six slices or eight? They said, oh, six. We couldn't eat eight. If you didn't get that, you're part of the problem. OK. <laughs> the pizza's no bigger. The slices get smaller, right? That's why the stock market and household net worth all look like they're at all-time highs, because the unit of measure is at an all-time low. If you have a yardstick, on one side, you have 36 inches, right? If each inch is a dollar, you've got a $36 yardstick. Flip it over. On the other side, you've got centimeters. You've got 100 centimeters. If each centimeter is a dollar, you've got a $100 yardstick. The yardstick's no different. It's just the unit of measure is smaller. Do you, does, that, does that make sense? OK, pizzanomics. Do you want your pizza cut into six slices or eight trillion? Right? Mighty skinny pieces. All right, the second part of this is raisinomics. OK? Now, here is the 15-ounce regular size Kellogg's Raisin Bran. And printed right on that box, it, what does it say? Two scoops. Now, you'll see the picture there. They're full of raisins. But you notice they don't say two scoops of raisins. That's because the lawyers got involved, OK? But clearly, they have a picture of two scoops of raisins in every box, right? Now, this is the 1.5 ounce individual size raisin bran. And guess what it says on the box? Two scoops. Wait a minute. I'm an accountant. Something's not right here. Seems to me, if we had a consistent unit of measure called the scoop, that that little box ought to be almost completely full of raisins. We need Barney Fife here. 
But it isn't. It looks perfectly normal. How did they do that? Ah, oh, they shrunk the scoop, right? Shrinking the unit of measure at the same rate as values drop maintains constant prices and averts panic. If we had not done this, then your, I tell my hospital people, your $50 million building would be on the market today for $10 million. Well, actually, your $640 million building today would be on the market for $10 million. Your $640,000 house would be on the market today for $100,000. Your $64,000 car would be on the market today for $10,000. And we'd all be going, oh, we're in a depression. We are in a depression, but you don't see it because they shrunk the unit of measure. OK? OK, when we talk about inflation, we usually also talk about unemployment. Now, the problem with the unemployment statistics you hear in the media are that when people st give up looking for a job, we stop counting them as unemployed. Isn't that convenient? Okay. When people get so discouraged, they give up looking for a job, we say, okay, they're no longer unemployed. They're not trying. Okay. Well, this is what's called the uh, labor force participation rate. Any economist will tell you this is a much superior measure. What this measures is the ratio of people who actually have a job to total able-bodied people capable of working. This is not retirees or disabled. If you're an able-bodied person capable of working, do you have a job? OK, it's so 1940, uh, where is that, 48? We saw some very nice job participation, job growth, up until the year 2000, growing nicely. And then we had, you know, Y2K, dot-com bubble, and then we came to 2008, and we went into a free fall. And that free fall continued until our immediate previous administration, where they stopped the three fall, free fall, turned the corner, and employment was coming back up again. Minority employment was at the highest it has ever been in the history of the country. Then came the lockdowns, destroyed everything. We dropped to a level we haven't seen since the early 1970s. And in the news, you will hear, oh, unemployment is, you know, um, uh, is at the best, uh, is, or how do they say it? Unemployment is, is, at a, is at a low relative to pandemic lows or something. Is that a high? I don't know how they say it, but they word it all twisted. Bottom line is, the low was down here, and we're now up here. We're nowhere near where we used to be. Okay, they're just using misleading gobbledygook. Yeah, unemployment has improved from horrible to less horrible, but it's still extremely horrible. Okay, all right. Now, where did all those people go? Well, um, food stamps. Okay, in 2008, we had 28 million people on food stamps. Today, we have 41 million. That's growth of nearly 47% over a 12 year period. Now, that's actually down from 46 million. It's down a little bit. As a percent of the population, in 2008, 9% of the people were on food stamps. Today, 12.5% of the people in this country are on food stamps, or one out of every eight people that you meet on the street. Okay. Now, I understand people have difficult circumstances, and I don't mean to belittle that at all. But what I say to my audience is, is that the kind of America you want to leave to your kids, where one out of every eight people you meet on the street is dependent on the government for their food. OK. Suggestions I've gotten from conference participants at professional conferences with financially savvy people. Oh, the national debt doesn't matter because monetary policy takes care of it. Magic. Wave our hands and it goes away. What that means is inflate the, the money supply. That's what we've been doing. What happens is you keep that up long enough and the currency loses credibility. People don't trust it anymore. Okay? China has already downgraded our federal bonds. Moody's rating service has already downgraded our federal bonds. And small countries who peg their currency to the US dollar are going to be hurt the most as we continue this inflation. And as we lose credibility in the currency, what will other countries look for? They will look for another currency or a market basket of currencies to use for their reserves. Enter the Chinese yuan. The Chinese yuan has now the first national digital currency in the world. 
It is not linked to the U.S. dollar-denominated global financial system, and they are staging it to compete with the U.S. dollar as a major world reserve currency. And they have been quoted as saying, the dollar's role should be reconsidered. They are masters of understatement. Now, you think this is just talk? In 2015, the International Monetary Fund awarded the yuan reserve currency status and one year later added them to what's called the special drawing rights market basket of currencies. That market basket consists of 42% US dollars, 31% euros, it's now 11% Chinese yuan, 8% Japanese yen, and 8% British pounds. That's the market basket of currencies that countries hold as their reserves, okay? The Chinese yuan is the only digital currency in the world, the only national digital currency. Now, if the US dollar loses credibility and shrinks, which one of these do you suppose is going to increase in predominance? I think the world is going to flock to the digital yuan. I think they are going to gain significant economic power throughout the world. OK, another option. Nationalize the Federal Reserve System. You know, if before you were married, you owed your, your, your fiance 20 bucks, and they owed you 20 bucks, after you get married, what happens? It's a wash, right? I owe you 20, you owe me 20, it's gone, right? If we were to nationalize the Federal Reserve, the bonds payable, bonds receivable would wash. We could wipe out eh, $3 trillion, $6 trillion. Well, what about the international, uh, oh, by the way, if we do that, we're giving the fox the key to the chicken coop, all right? Because then Congress could do whatever they want with the money supply without even having the pretense of having to go to the Board of Governors of the Federal Reserve, which are private banks, by the way. The international trade deficit. You know, we owe other countries money. They owe us money. Yeah, it's a wash, right? Not really. We have a trade deficit. That means we owe other countries a lot more money than they owe us. But even if they were equal and they just were a wash, that again only wipes out maybe three trillion. So we're looking here at what? Nine trillion dollars out of 290? It's still only a drop in the bucket. Now, our prior century economists tried this approach in their 1957 episode called A Merry Mix-Up. Now you'll notice this is with Joseph Wardell who replaced uh, Jerome Horvitz. Uh, uh, who passed away of a cerebral hemorrhage. That was Curly. Remember, Moses was Mo, Lewis was Larry, and uh, Jerome was Curly, and this is now Joe, who was Curly Joe. And hopefully this will work. You fine? Mm -hmm. Speaking of money, how about the 20 bucks you owe me? Oh, yeah. Well, I only got 10, so here's 10, I owe you 10. Thanks. Hey, Mo, you owe me 20. Well, here's 10, I'll owe you 10. Uh-uh, you owe me 20. Here's 10, I owe you 10. Here's the 10, I owe you. Here's the 10, I owe you. Does that sound like Congress? That's what we're talking about. We're talking about ridiculousness, right? Okay. Now, I said we're supposed to be talking about health care reform, and I've only got a few minutes here. But the Affordable Care Act added a $1.2 trillion entitlement uh, program, uh, and uh, the prior administration minimized it. The current administration is reviving it. The problem with it is there's some popular features that are very, very expensive. Number one, keeping our kids on our parents' insurance through age 26, very popular. No pre-existing condition exclusions. This is very popular. People with cancer didn't want to change jobs because they'd lose their health benefits for nine months, right? Or people who are pregnant or whatever. So this is very popular. Guaranteed insurability. You know, people with disabilities can't get insurance. Guaranteed insurability means they can have insurance. No annual or lifetime caps. You're not going to cut me off and leave me high and dry when I exhaust my benefits. These are very popular, but they're very expensive. So the problem is how to make this economically viable. And it's still a very hard sell with young people. You know, the whole plan was designed to have a certain percentage of young people, young and healthy, uh, paying in premiums so that we could subsidize the old and sickies, right? Well, that's a hard sell for the kids. Say, I don't need it. I don't want it. I can't afford it. And why should I pay in money to subsidize these old people? And so they don't, they don't want to do it. They, they have found ways around it. They buy less expensive, non-compliant plans, and they pay the penalty, and it's still cheaper if they pay it at all. And in the previous administration, we waived the penalty. We didn't enforce them. Uh, and so there was no bite. 
But what happens when these kids fall off their bicycle? Where do they go? To the emergency room, where it is the most expensive venue for treating them. OK, so why don't people buy insurance? Well, the number one reason they can't afford it, too expensive. Number two, um, not eligible. Number three, don't need it, don't want it. Um, signing up is too difficult and confusing. I uh, can't find a plan that meets my needs and other. OK, so that's why they don't buy it. It's a hard sell. OK, for insurance companies, this means higher costs. Um, you know, at most, we've only had 12 to 13 million people sign up on these uh, health exchanges, and that's only about 15% of the uninsured. This was sold as a means to get all 40 million of the uninsured insured. Well, we've only tapped about 15% of the uninsured. And we've only got about 28% young and healthy. The target was 40%. We're nowhere near what it needs to be. Now, the number of insurers uh, will drop for a while, but has come back. The number of insurers on each of these exchanges uh, started high, dropped, and now is coming back. It's now actually more than when we first started. And the medical loss ratios uh, were pretty stable for large groups and small groups, but for individuals, they went way up and then dropped way down. They have to pay out 85% uh, of the premium dollars they collect in actual medical benefits, and they've been able to get that down to about 75%, I guess, which means they owe you money back. Okay, the ACA, or the Affordable Care Act, provided incentives for improving the quality of health care, but did very little to reduce the cost of delivering care or improve efficiencies in delivering health care. Uh, there's enormous inefficiencies in the delivery of health care. These are where reform is still very much needed. One thing we can be absolutely certain of, that over time, the costs will escalate. Medicare today costs 330 times more than its first full year in 1967. And um, when you think about what the economic uh, uh, crisis is going to bring, think about this in 1 Thessalonians 5.3, for when they shall say, peace and safety, at last we've got everything we need and want, then sudden destruction comes upon them as travail upon a woman with child. Um, you know, we're politically, we're pulling one way, and then we're pulling the other way, and pulling harder this way, and pulling harder that way, like a woman in labor, right? That's what's happening. Okay, now, David Walker, the former Comptroller General of the United States, understands these issues better than anyone else. When we were meeting with him as a group, we asked him, well, David, what do you plan to do? And he said, and this is, I heard him my very own self, well, my house is paid for, I get a pension at full salary for life, just like a Supreme Court judge, and I'm thinking about Vancouver because New Zealand's too far away. All right, who can name that tune? Come on. We were all Christians. You were all Christians, yeah. <laughs> it's not too hard. It begins with we. We got to get out of this. I heard it over here first. We got to get out of this place. Whoa, did you catch it? Oops, sorry. We got to get out of this place. Okay, now who was the band who played that song? Nope. I'll give you a hint. The Beatles, the birds, the turtles, the animals. The animals. There you go. Oh, I forgot the monkeys. That's right. Forgot the monkeys. The animals. Okay, now, of course, there's always beautiful Corpus Christi. Believe it or not, that really is the view from my living room. Isn't that nice? And when down there, I forget all of this. I just love it down there. Okay, thank you very much. I think we made it pretty much on the button here. We thank you all for coming. We hope you enjoyed the show. Tune in next Sunday for more excitement and adventure. Have a good night. <laughs>